I just realized I'm I'm moving around to the music of the game that no one else can hear. <laughs> All right, one more minute and we'll get started. All right, let's get going. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Dan Butchko. I am the CEO and founder of Playcrafting. Uh, we here at Playcrafting represent one of the largest communities of game developers in the US. Uh, we're offering events, classes, etc. cetera, uh, right now completely virtual uh, to keep you connected, discovering games, meeting developers, learning about building games. You, you name it, we got it uh, across the board in terms of games and making them and playing them. So. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure some folks that are joining us have been uh, joining us throughout the week. This is pretty much Canada week here at Playcrafting. We featured uh, developers from Montreal earlier this week. Uh, and today we are so, so excited to have the team from Lightning Rod Games with a Fold Apart, which is launching today. And so the entire team is here, uh, just so you have a sense of how this is gonna work. We're gonna go through, do a live demo, play a couple videos, and then have some discussion with each of the team members. Throughout today's events, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them right down below in the Q&A section. We'll have time for some Q&A at the end. Uh, and uh, it's gonna be an awesome time. What a, what a road it's been, and we're so excited to be here to launch the game today. So without further ado, I'm so excited to welcome and introduce Mark from Lightning Rod Games. Hey, Mark, how you feeling? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm so excited the game's finally out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so I understand that the whole team is here with us today, right? It is, yeah. Cool. So why don't you introduce each person and tell us about uh, their role on the game and with the team? Sure. Okay. So I'm Mark. I'm one of the co-founders of Lightning Red. Um, and so my, my main role on the team has been doing game design and the business development. I'm also here with Steven, my co-founder. Hello. I, my main role is the tech lead and then just filling in on everything else wherever I can. Also here with Stephanie. Hi, I'm the art director here. Yep. And David. Hi, I'm the animator. And Ryan. Hi, uh, I'm Ryan. I'm the second programmer. And Kit. Hi, I'm Kit. I'm the other game designer. Nice. Welcome, think, everyone. Everyone does a little bit more than just their title, though. I mean, yeah. I think every every single it's a small team. Every single person has worn a whole bunch of hats on this project. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say, I bet everyone is just picking sort of like whatever the most recent thing is that they did. Yeah. <laughs> We're awesome. all, we so, all have specializations, I would say, probably more so than anything else, and then and then we all just help out where we can in uh, yeah. different areas. So. Makes a ton of sense. So, so Mark, why don't you tell us about the game, uh, and then we're going to roll a trailer. Okay. So, A Fold Apart is a puzzle game about a long-distance relationship in a world of folding paper. Um, I don't. I, do you want me to get into more detail on that, or you, can we show the trailer and I can kind of explain some stuff after that, maybe? Let's do the trailer first. That okay. sounds good. Yeah, because I think it helps seeing a visual with it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so A Fold Apart is about these two characters. There's an architect and a teacher. And the architects moved off to the city and to work on a big project. And they're living apart and kind of going through the emotional ups and downs of being in a long distance relationship. So a lot of the game is about the two characters communicating with one another via text message. And inevitably what happens when you're talking via text is there's mis miscommunication and that causes other characters to either misinterpret what the other person meant or read a little bit too much into it. And they kind of go into like these emotional states of turmoil um, where, where a lot of the puzzle solving happens. And so the puzzles themselves are kind of the way that the characters are working through the emotions that they're feeling from being apart from one, each other, uh, apart from one another. And it's like them working through those emotions and, and, and figuring out a way to, to kind of process them positively, I guess. One thing I was really struck by was the timing of the launch. Now that we are all socially distanced yeah. and every, pretty much every relationship or most relationships are long distance right now. Um, did that, did that impact like the release or was it just completely coincidental? That's, no, yeah, <laughs> no, we've been working on the game for four and a half years. So it was just like, this is when the game was done finally. And, and it was just, um, I mean, it, it's, it's not, it's not really, great like it's not i'm not happy that more people are kind of experienced long distance because it's a really tough scenario to be in um mm -hmm. i think it, it probably may resonate more with more people than when we anticipated when we started making the game um it was really i would say the game was a way for me to kind of work through some of the emotions that i felt when i was going through a long distance relationship and i really kind of just wanted to make a game that touched on those and might resonate with especially with other people who had been in that situation and hopefully present it in a way that could be empathetic for someone who hadn't. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're releasing it into an environment where almost everyone is experiencing a separation of, of one form or another. And so it, it may resonate with people, but also hopefully maybe um, it could help provide comfort for, for people who are kind of struggling with the emotions, knowing that, you know, this is something that when you're apart, this is this is normal to feel this way because it's it's difficult and it's it's novel in a lot of ways too. So for sure. Uh, and you brought a, a live demo presentation too. Why don't you walk us through the game? Sure. Okay. So Steven's going to play. I'll, I'll kind of talk over it, I guess, while we go through it. And uh, cool. we can get some chime in from, from other people on the team too. Great. And as we're going along, folks that are watching, make sure you pop any questions you have into the Q&A section below for when we get to the Q&A at the end. Sorry. Give me a second. It's not showing it as an option anymore. No. Oh. Oh, boo. I wonder because you all tabbed out. OK, here we go. Oh, there we go. Can, can you hear, hear the audio? Can't see it yes, yet, we can. Yeah. OK. There we go. Oh, there we go, yeah. Yep. Cool. OK. All right, so we'll start from the new. We'll just talk, we'll talk through this then. Yeah, so, I'm going to let you drive remotely. OK, just pick a, you can pick a slot. I'll just get to the character selection. So one of the, the first things um, players are able to do is is select the couple that um, they feel best represents their relationship. And so uh, this was something that kind of got suggested to us at one point um, by one of our, our um, funding partners. They're like, why, why, why don't we just like give choices for all the genders? And we're like, oh, that's a really cool idea. <laughs> and it's like, it's not, it wasn't, it was like something that we we're like, yeah, that's really good. We want to do that. It means, it means something to us on the team to, to be able yeah. to provide that option. In the, so. in the original game, we wanted the characters to be identifiable to everybody. Yeah. So in an older version of the game, the characters were more abstract, non-human, genderless, like iconic designs. And gotcha. because like iconic designs tend to be more relatable to more people, because the more like specific you make something, the more it's clear that it's, it's not you. And then, the story wasn't resonating and we wanted to pivot back to the original inspiration which was the long distance relationship that mark experienced yeah. and then when we took it back to that uh took it back to that we were just like oh well that kind of sucks because we're gonna we're gonna lose this and then yeah someone we were working with was just like well why don't uh <laughs> why don't you just give people all the options and then we we kind of measured it's like can we like is this something like a small team can do and then we figured okay it's worth it and then we went ahead with that uh are there quick polls does it, do people want to pick which couple oh can we do that 
<laughs> yeah, folks in the audience, pop into the chat. Which uh, which do you, couple do you want us to pick? We do numbers, or I guess we do top top bottom, bottom left, right. left right. Yeah, okay. yeah, top bottom left or right. First one. Oh, Thomas Brown says top. All right. Okay. So one thing actually we're able to do too is in English, we actually don't use any gender pronouns in the game at all because most of it's talking directly to each other. Um, we weren't able to do it in all the languages, unfortunately, but uh, it, was, it was one of an extra thing that we were able to do in the game, which was pretty cool. Yeah, when I was playing this morning, I, I could tell uh, that it was very inclusive in even the ways that the characters are texting each other and talking to each other. Something weird happened. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's new. That's all right. Oh. You have to like close it and bring it back open or something. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's weird. I was playing on the Steam version earlier. Let us know if there's anything we can do on our end. No, my computer's been a little bit funky. Oh, whoops. Or I can share it too if we need to. No, 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 it's it's fine. I just need to turn screen sharing back on. Do, 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 do. I don't know if it yeah, was like a, little bit. I'll just a, video, about the a video and Zoom thing. That was okay. it. Looks like we're coming back. Yep. There we go. I don't know if it'll come through on the video. That, that little side hug thing that the teacher does is like one of my favorite animations in the game. Yep. <laughs> it's in our trailer too, so if, if you watch the trailer, you'll see it. Um, we put it in there because it's, it's really cute. I believe it is called the sneaky hug. Yeah, David just <laughs> like added that when he was doing the animation and it was like, yes, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> well, it starts out as like, you're kind of far apart, which I do to bring them together. <laughs> <laughs> and right. I added that seems like everybody liked it. Yeah. <laughs> the airport's empty because <laughs> we didn't yeah. have any, we don't have any other characters in the game. His office is pretty or the architect's office is pretty empty too for the same reason. Um <laughs> yeah, we can just pretend that everyone's already physically distant, distancing themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Mark, you're, you're watching me, but you're supposed to be talking. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is this is just our, well, this is the first part. We're not even at the puzzle yet, right? So yep. the one of the things we want to do is is we tell some of the story also through text that's kind of in the in the background. And so in this first level here, it's the teacher kind of talking to the architect to kind of lead them through through the game. And so one of the one one of the things that we really wanted to do was was kind of illustrate how the paper mechanics worked sort of before you got to the papers. And so this idea of having the teacher kind of lead you through this first tutorial um, was, was pretty interesting. So like as they fly, they'll like undo flips and undo folds and stuff like that. Um, and, and kind of showing you how the paper moves before you get to it. Um, so that was the first puzzle uh, where we could like flip the paper. Actually, we can just do it on this one, Steven, before you, before you solve it. Yep. Um, so, so every puzzle in the game has two sides, like a piece of paper. And so there's platforms on each side. So you can, 
you can stand on one side, you can flip the other. So there's platforms on that side and then there's platforms on the front. And so one of the things I have to try to do is get the character from one part of the level to the other. So in, in some cases, it's like this one where um, you have to get the, the architect across that gap to the buildings on, on the other side. And so the way that we do that is by folding the paper and merging them. So if you look at the screens, um, the right edge is glowing. It has like a little glowing effect. Um, yeah, until you start folding it. Then when you start folding it, you can like commit it and, um, and flatten it out and it kind of connects the, uh, the two platforms together. So now you can kind of walk across, you can get all the way to the next part of, of the level. Uh, and then this level here is a good example of um, ways that we can, you can kind of move the, the character around between the two sides as well. And it also kind of introduces one of our other objectives, which is sometimes you have to get to a star. And so here the characters on the back and like you can fold from the back to the front and then now they can kind of get to the other side of the paper itself and then get to the star, which will actually take them to the next part. <laughs> And then the other kind of core feature, so we have flipping, we have folding, and then like the third feature in the game that pretty much all the puzzles are based off of is unfolding. So after a fold is committed, you can also unfold it and basically not un well, not undo the puzzle, but just like unfold the, the paper itself. So right here we have like that right sides folded over and you can un unfold it. So now they can walk across the platform. So that's kind of our that was our tutorial. It's basically how we teach all the the three main mechanics to the to the players, and then at the end of this first level, we kind of give a real puzzle. I, I call it, where it it kind of combines all three of those aspects into into one actual puzzle. So here, the arch the architects in the middle, and they're trying to get to the teacher on the right side, and so okay, so yeah, so you can fold from the left. So there's a platform on the back there on that side. So you can fold it to where the architect is and commit it. And so that will let you walk there. So now if you unfold this, you can unfold and show them on the back, Steven. So now when we unfold the, the characters over there, so they, they still can't quite reach the higher level when they're down there. So if we flip back to the other side again, um, what we can do is we can fold. So we can fold past where they were and connect it to the, the platform on the right side. And so that's one way that you can kind of get across gaps. So there's no jumping because we don't, the characters aren't able to jump. So it's not like a, a full platformer, but one of the ways that you cross gaps or get to different elevations is by connecting platforms in creative ways, I guess. Yep. It's, it functions as a gate also, because like when we're showing people exactly what to do, they can just follow along, like, uh, oh, do this, do that. Um, but if we were to put them into the regular game, then they'd be totally lost. Uh, one of the other um, guidance tools, I guess, are the glowing edges. And so the folds that you can make in this level are limited to the edges that glow. And the reason that was introduced was when Mark was playtesting the game with, like, Mark ran playtests pretty regularly early on. And um, there was too much possibility space. Yeah. Yeah, because the game, the later in the game, you can fold um, from the diagonals as well. So there's later in the game, you can fold from eight different directions on both sides. So in, in a way, you can have like 16 different possible folds that you could make at any given point in time. Um, so we, when we first had those early levels, we had all 16 available to the player. And um, it, it just got really, it got really overwhelming. And so we, we cut back on that. We introduced things a lot slower now in the game. So even in this level, you're still only folding from the sides. Um, so this is a good example. Now you get to switch between the two characters. You can, you actually get to experience the long distance relationship from the perspective of both the architect and the teacher character. And um, they do their text messaging. And so we have some, we have some choices in here. Most of the choices are mostly just for personal choice. It, they don't affect the story in a, in a really meaningful way. It's more just like, you could, you're, it gives the players a way to provide a little bit more personality um, to each of the characters themselves. Um, you can make jokes. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's a, you can make a joke, be more flirty versus more serious. And it's just like what the personal preference for how, how players want to express um, how those characters, how they feel the characters would act in a certain situation. It's more for personal expression than it is anything else. 
Um, <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it continues off from the end of the previous the previous level. So the architect was like, "Hey, I was just thinking of you," and then now we actually see that in real time. And your time zones are very very different. So the architect is is a few hours ahead of the of the teacher character who's kind of just walking home from work. Um, so yeah, so it goes back and forth. There's a little bit of choice here, and like kind of establishes this idea of like you know time zones are different. Um, you know they miss each other, they joke around. I get a little bit of personality differences between the two characters. So the the architect is a lot more introverted, um, shy, a little bit like they they're very they're very work focused, and the the teacher is a lot more um, a lot more outgoing, uh, a little bit more silly. The architects probably more they like puns <laughs> so there, there's a lot of times where the, the architect will send like a, a pun or a funny pun to the teacher yeah. character and stuff like that like the glue one that just happened yes exactly <laughs> a sticky situation yeah yeah so, and he's also a bit of a nerd so um gets to make like <laughs> dante's inferno <laughs> references in the middle of the game <laughs> is that from personal experience <laughs> not, that, not that some, some of them, yeah. That one, that one wasn't. I just thought it was funny, and they got to gotcha. do the, the the joke about the puppy, which I thought was fun. So, um, so this next paper will kind of ex kind of show like the like, the last really core element of, of the gameplay, which is inevitably when you're texting, there's miscommunication that happens, and so you know the architect's like, hey, I just had a dream when we were together in the city and everything was perfect, and mm. the teacher's like, wait, what do you mean, like? everything was perfect while we were together and, and they have a bit of a mo more of emotional reaction to it than the architect may have intended and so that kind of puts the teacher into like this we call it the real world versus the emotional world so that's what that's what they're going into right now and these emotional world is where all the the puzzles take place so we can we'll get down into some of the puzzles let's kind of show a little bit of the new mechanics and then we'll probably cut it from there i don't want to i don't want to give too much of the of the puzzle mechanics away because that's a lot of the fun of the game. So, right. um, we actually had to come up with four art styles for this. So we have yeah. the real world uh, for where the teacher lives, and the real world. Well, I shouldn't say art styles, but aesthetics. Uh, so the real world where the teacher lives, the real world where the architect lives, uh, the emotional world where the teacher is going through their emotions. Uh, but they have their perception, their emotional perception of where they are and where the architect is. And then when the architect is in the emotional world, they have their own perception of where they are and where the teacher is. Yeah. So here, a lot of the, we call it the internal dialogue, is, is about the teacher kind of working through the emotion of, of, that, of that, receiving that text message and, and some of the, the feelings that they're having about, um, you know, I don't really want to move to a city. I like, I like being where I am and, you know, I thought you were coming home and stuff like that. And so they're feeling a bit of doubt, a little bit of anger with the, the city. So we kind of represent that with this obstacle, which is like just something from the city blocking them, sort of like a, a walk and cross signal just mixed with a bunch of different things. It's just, it's just <laughs> the city's bad in this situation. So we, we right, can't go right. past it. You can't walk past it. Um, so the puzzle here, what you can do though, is you can fold over them. And so a lot of, some of the puzzles in scene two are about how do you cover them up in order to get to where you're trying to get to. So that's kind of, that's kind of the overall thing we're doing here. And so also you can see in this, in these levels here in scene two, we can fold from both left and right. On both sides of the paper so we're kind of start introducing a little bit more freedom um, to the player to to kind of experiment and and take a look at um, different ways the, the papers work and things like that so um, i guess the next thing we can show just on this next one steven we, we have a hint system in the game too um, so if players are ever looking for for a hint on how to to do a uh, to do a puzzle actually although this one i think only has one step but we'll see <laughs> so it will step you through um, move my move. And so you only really see as much or as little of the, the hint that you want. So the first time you press, yeah, it's, it's going to do the whole thing. Um, just because there's only one fold on this one. But usually what it will do is like only one fold or one unfold at a time. So mm. you only really see as much of the puzzle solution as you really want to see. And then you can take over at any point and kind of finish off from there. So 
I think we'll call the. I think we'll cut the demo there. That's probably a good spot. So I mean, we can uh, let people play the game and, and take a look at it for themselves. That menacing sign is so funny. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. That's fun. It used to be black tentacles with smoke, and that didn't make any sense. Yeah, it was just weird. It was just like, oh, it doesn't really make any sense. So we like, oh, well, like they're mad about the city. So like, why don't we make it something that's like evocative of the city that's not really in, it's, it feels out of place when it's like in the, in the town setting, right? So. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Um, well, oh, I understand I, you I have- I just remembered this yep. too. Uh, we have lots of different control schemes. So you can play with oh, like- the controller or the mouse and keyboard. And we're going to be adding a, uh, a single click version in a, in a patch sometime later. Yeah, so we have, nice. we also have touch controls for- Sorry, it's single click, mouse only mode, I mean. Yeah, so like Apple Arcade um, on iPad and iPhones, you can play, you play with touch. And so we're basically going to take those touch controls and port them to a, like a single mouse mode where you just basically play the entire game using your mouse. Um, so that will be patched into the Mac and PC versions at some point too. So nice. Yeah. I understand that you have a, a gameplay video to show too from something later in the game too. Uh, maybe no, maybe. I don't think so. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna keep we're gonna keep it hidden. For now. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for for that peek at the the start of the game. Um, you know, I've read a lot, uh, Mark, about the inspiration for the game from your own mm -hmm. life. Um, and uh, why don't you talk to us a little bit about, you know, building a game that is, uh, you know, based around something that you've gone through and, and how you've maybe injected some of your personal experience into specific moments of the game. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, so so prior to starting Light Your Eye Games, I was working in California at Disney Interactive. Uh, played them for, for about a year and a half. And my significant other was living in Ontario still for that whole time. So, you know, that whole year and a half, we were living apart, basically three time zones and almost an entire continent apart from one another. So <laughs> there's a lot of emotional ups and downs that we went through um, while we were apart from, from each other. And I always thought that was an interesting um, basis for a story. I was like, it would be really cool to make a game about a long distance relationship because it's not something you see you definitely don't see it in games, but you, you don't really even see it covered very much in media as a whole. So I thought it would be kind of unique and, and interesting to kind of go through it. Um, but I wanted game mechanics that kind of matched it. And I didn't really know how to do that at first. So it kind of went on the back burner. And we, Steve and I started our studio in 2013 and we, we worked on some other, other projects before we kind of went to GDC one year and we went to the experimental gameplay workshop, which is our favorite session of the whole of the whole show and afterwards i put steven on the spot and i was like okay steven what what are some game mechanics that we you know we've never seen before <laughs> that we can do we can make a game about and um he was good he actually actually has an answer to it so he was steven's like oh what about the back of a mad magazine and i was like oh that's interesting so you have like one picture and you fold it and then you make a second picture. oh yeah that's yeah. right yeah. and then the, yeah. then the world changes but the way yeah. i was thinking about it was just like the one picture like one side of a paper yeah. Uh, I asked Mark, well, what do you want to make a game about? Instantly, it's like the long distance relationship. And then we said something along the lines of, well, too bad those things don't work together at all. And then we <laughs> continued with our food until a couple months <laughs> later, he calls me up and he's like, I've got it. And I don't know what he's talking about until he sticks a piece of paper in the webcam. It's like, yeah, There's a guy over here. And then you flip it over. And if you fold him like this, you can walk across. And I was like, ooh. And it, it all went from there. I think I went over to his place, like maybe it was that weekend. And we just started figuring things out on graph paper. Like what kind of yeah. so I have a whole bunch. game mechanics. Gonna, I'll hold one up. So this is, this is like one of the puzzles from the game. Oh, I don't know if it's going to work with the... Well, nope, maybe not at no, all. Not with the virtual background. All right. Well, anyways, I have I have some, I have some grid paper um, with all the every single puzzle in the game um, has been drawn on grid paper at some point or another. Um, so it was how we how we did a lot of the testing, and then uh, Stephen made a tool inside Unity that basically let us convert the digital graph or uh, the physical graph paper to like a, a digital version. So everything is based on a grid system, which is really cool. Yep, but it's hidden to the player. Right. So like everything moves around and animates pretty smoothly, but in the background, it kind of figures out what you're actually trying to do. And then it just animates and 
the paper to that spot. So when you're you're trying to line up a an edge or something like that, it's like, oh, I see what you're doing, and then and then just does it. Nice. And uh, and I know you were talking about the characters themselves, you know, looking a little bit different and taking on different forms through different iterations. Stephen, I, th I think you have some like early uh, <laughs> concepts and stuff that you wanted to show, right? So much. So we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for it. Folks love seeing how games are an iterative process, and so uh, getting a peek at things have how things have evolved over the years is helpful. Yeah, because okay. Stephen was talking about our original idea of like the characters being like these non people they weren't people they were like we were using like wally and eva as like kind of um a concept well <laughs> that, that's basically toothless <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that was was kind of like, yeah that was that was like a, a joke but we we like the the style of that character this was done yeah. by um a previous artist don toledo yeah um a lot of these early concepts were done by him so yeah this was yeah this was like one of the first ones where it was like i can't remember which character that was but um we had these characters they were ori and zay um and they well, were like these two little them. aliens oh is this both of them oh yeah okay or concepts different or ones concepts the for them one. yeah yeah and so they're gonna be like these kind of like cute little characters um this one's was actually pointy, before ori and Black Forest came and out, so it's kind of good because we were like oh ori because like origami that's where that name came from and then, oh gotcha then gotcha. ori and the blind forest came out like a year later and we're like oh that's Good that we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had uh, another concept artist, uh, Jonathan Standing, and then we started saying, okay, well, let's make it, let's actually go with the game of it being about a long distance relationship between these two characters. And so the way that we were thinking of it was there was like real life architect and teacher that were in the long distance relationship, and then there would be like these paper golems that were made out of like paper physically from their desks um mm. and kind of represented their emotions uh so the architect's character was literally made out of blueprint paper so they were blue and the teacher's character was made out of like construction paper and so they were like brown they had like i think the one that we eventually settled on was like they were like this brown color with like um like a purple and orange dress that was kind of held together with a paper clip which is pretty cool oh wow um, so, yeah i think we have we're, do we so have those yep what had happened too was the way the story was going to be told was that they they'd live inside the apartments of yeah. each member of the couple and so you'd see the apartment change as the game progressed oh, and wow. so it was the apartment that was going to to tell the story and there were um totems that you were collecting inside the game yeah. and the totems would be like little symbols of the... like things from a date or something like that like a, yeah. a movie oh. stub or things like that and so yeah like it was much more like like it's photorealistic world sort of and then the characters lived within it i would say maybe like um unravel in some ways where it's like a very real world scenario and then the characters are, are kind gotcha. of made out of physical op of physical material within it um it just never really felt right though it just it felt it felt a little bit too abstracted yeah they were um, like tinker toys and origami actually the, the very first one was just straight up origami uh and mm -hmm. then and then jonathan made these crumpled paper people and it was just like i think i've got something here and i i was <laughs> i was skeptical but i let him run with it because i was really curious to see where it was going to go mm -hmm. and uh it went to here is one that i quite like I'll say, yeah that's the teacher oh, character yeah. I think the one to the right is the actual, the two of them. The one on the right of this? Yeah, there yeah. we go. Those oh, are the, yeah. two, the two characters made out of the actual physical paper. I remember seeing, I think, a trailer or something with yeah. these Well, we presented this. Right? We actually took it to GDC. We were part, so it was really funny. So we were inspired originally. Um, the paper kind of folding mechanic came out of us, a discussion that came out of us attending the Experimental Gameplay Workshop. And then we were fortunate enough to actually be able to present at it in uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. And so the version that we brought there was with the, with the old art style, um, and uh, we just um, I don't know we just it it wasn't it wasn't quite hitting where we wanted it to, um, and we end up we end up hiring uh, Stephanie in April 2017. Yep, Stephanie where, came in soon after, yeah. and uh, uh, things really started rolling from there. That's when it felt like the game yeah. was really starting to get built. And then David came on just a, a couple months after that too. Yeah. 
And so gotcha. that was the that was the core team for a while was the the five of us, um, which was um, like Stephanie, David, Mark, myself, and Don. And Stephanie's on with us still, right? Yep. yep. Awesome. So Stephanie, why don't you walk us through a little bit of the uh, the process of taking the the characters and the art from where it was when you first joined to where it is now. Yeah, so I start uh, with the character. So Stephen was discussed with me, uh, should we uh, start with the environment? But um, so personally, I love to start with the character. So once the start uh, the character, everybody like it, then the environment is like a pretty straightforward for me or everybody can agree. Okay, so uh, here's our character. So uh, we just made something match fit uh, the environment is like much simpler. So mm. uh, I do love the um, idea about the uh, paper like origami or like the crumble paper. But uh, so so I just like uh, start from there and try to make it. So when you design character present the player itself, um, one very important part is you have to make it perfect and also imperfect. You need to have some uh, imperfect part on the character, but in a good way, right? Say, so, uh, um, yeah, that, that's, that's hard, but so that will be a hook because if someone is like so perfect, you wouldn't picture the character as yourself. So uh, the player will be harder to get uh, into the story. So um, that's um, uh, so that's a I, I think a very important part to create create a character that's for the player. Yeah. So nice. um, and yes. Have you have you worked on art for games in the past too? Yeah, it's uh, around certain years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice these are some of the wow we, so it's really funny like the color scheme for the architect's always been we kind of like the blue like like blueprint paper made sense so they always had like these cool colors so like you'll see like all of the architect concepts are like they're already blue <laughs> and so yeah, like, yeah. actually this is cool because one of the things that steven was kind of skimming through before so we had the characters were fully in one character in one color scheme and then i don't remember where the idea came from that was the idea of, of having a part, like a piece of each of them have um, the color scheme of the other character as kind of almost like a, a way for them to, to keep them close, um, which mm. I always thought was really neat. So we end up going with like, the architect has like an orange tie and then the, the teacher has like a blue, some blue highlights on like the sweater oh, yeah. and, the, and, the, and, the, and their feet and stuff like their shoes. And then um, I think the male, or sorry, the, sorry, the, the, the female architect has like a, an orange uh, hair clip instead of the tie. So that was one of the ways that we kept, we wanted to have like little pieces of color scheme from the other character in, in their overall aesthetic, which I really liked. I think that worked really well in the scarf for the female TG. Wow. Yeah. It looks like the old logo too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the old logos that we did. Nice. Talk a little bit about the, like the design of, of the world uh, itself. Okay, Stephanie, you want to go through that? Uh, the world itself? Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, so we have real world, and but it's still in low poly style um, because of our budget. Uh, so it, the most of it, the most difficult part to me is like, so how do we do the real world and the emotional world? like kind of in the sense style and but also you can tell the difference um yeah so um we try we try first of all we try to set up the environment inside the paper then we decide to add different background behind the uh world so for real world there will there will be a disc like from the real world behind of the paper um uh, once you get into the emotional world, there will be uh, a kind of more magical background and with the particle system, like some effects to uh, symbol that 
uh, you are entering uh, another world. And I feel after we did that, uh, that part is like uh, much better. Hmm. Yeah. We played with shapes a lot more too, I think in the emotional world, right? Like the architect's a lot more angular. This is like some of the, like the clouds, these are the cloud concepts yeah. for, the, for the architect's oh. emotional world. So they're a lot more square. And then the teachers are a lot more round. Whereas like the real world was the same style for both of them in some ways, like it's, it was more even. Um, I remember one of the things that we did, and I'm like, I'm still amazed that Stephanie was able to do this because it was like, the pitch was, we want it to look like paper, but not made out of paper, <laughs> like physically made <laughs> out of paper. Right. And so, <laughs> which is a pretty abstract and, and vague way of explaining what we were trying to go for. And Stephen, Stephen was probably much better at explaining it than I was, but um, we ended up well, hitting it. I was, I'm really happy with it. There, there, was, there was a lot of work um, and like inspiration too from other places like Stephanie. Um, yeah, like we, we had, Pinterest boards of just all kinds of stuff of just like, what's, is there anything else out there that's like achieving this? What do we like about it? What don't we like about it? But I mean, like Stephanie, we just kept sending Stephanie stuff and sending her stuff. And then, and then Stephanie is like this. Well, <laughs> and then we, we iterate and iterate and iterate. It was, it was <laughs> very simplified way to say it. Yeah. 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 But, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, it was a really, it was a really nice process and working with mm -hmm. Stephanie on this is just really wonderful because yeah. it was just constantly flowing or at least that's what it seemed from my perspective. I don't know if you ever got stuck, Stephanie, <laughs> you, you might've been pulling your hair out at some point. I don't really know. No, no. I really love the process because, um, so, uh, I, I guess, um, at some point that I, uh, so some people will think artists, they should focus one style. Uh, but myself feel like, oh, there are so many arts are so beautiful. They are all beautiful, right? So I normally won't push like my personal preference like too hard. And I also welcome everybody to give different opinion or idea. And because I am only one person, so if I can use someone's brain, then yeah, mm -hmm. that's good for me. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah, like you probably noticed like in, inside some of these concepts, there's little bits of art inserted that are from like other artists. It's like, oh, we, we like this. And it's like, what are they doing here? And then I, I don't think we should be too shy about like sharing our influences because like, I mean, like, ideas spread around, they help. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then David is with us and he's the animator on the project. David, why don't you talk us through, you know, taking Stephanie's designs, especially for the characters themselves and bringing them to life through animation. So like it all started, like when I applied for this job and <laughs> I was given two characters, not like, uh, I was like, like the application, like they, uh, they give me an animation test. Like they have the description of the characters, like how they act. And, but like the character I'm using is like generic. Um, what was that? It's uh, the, el the 11 rig. 11, yeah, 11, uh, 11 second club. If any animator know, like, you know, they give out, uh, um, they give you like every month, they give you a uh, clip of audio, you can animate it with it. Mm. Yeah, so they give me that character, a male and female, and give me like the description of um, the architect and the teacher told me to animate. I guess I did pretty well, so. so <laughs> can I mean, we show it, David, can we, we have it. Can we, sure, can we, we have it, it. Okay, but. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Yeah, I guess you guys have to show oh, yeah, it. Yeah, really right. let, me, let me just my screen right now. Let me just talking. download it real quick. Um, okay. just to make it's sure actually in our it's on folder. Dropbox. Yeah. Oh yeah, but I, I didn't know what folder it was in. So oh, okay. okay. It's fine. So Anyways, yeah. yeah. So it's all started from there. I was like, I, I had no um because before that even in the um in the website of like a photo part, I like I saw the uh, the older character design, and I was like, okay, 
it, they can work. But like when I got in, I saw Stephanie's design. I was like, oh my God, this is so pretty. And I just, <laughs> yeah, it all started from there. And so in animation, I, I don't know what I should talk about. Like it's kind of um, actually pretty, cause I, my background, I, um, before this, before joining Lightning Rod, I was uh, working in Ubisoft Shanghai. Mm -hmm. I was like, I worked on a little bit of um, a two Assassin's Creed title, which I mainly just like doing, um, doing rigging. And I animated in uh, Far Cry Primal, but only animals. Like basically in Ubisoft Shanghai, they're, they're like basically the outsource company of like internal outsource company of um, of Ubisoft itself. It's like, gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah. So people who don't like, um, there are tasks from like all over like other Ubisoft, like they don't want to do it, they throw it to us. So I ended up animating some animals and I ended up animate some like there was one like mobile game, mm. but there's not that much animation and animating like this animation, um, the test animation, like the even though the uh, characters are more or less um, cartoony, but they the proportion is way more closer to real people than you know the ones in our game. So the, I guess the most challenging thing is like animating um, teacher and architect with their proportion. Sometimes I have to animate them interacting and with their like short arms and large head. It's <laughs> pretty challenging sometimes, but it's also really satisfying once you animating something like, like feels natural. Like the one Mark talked about in the in the uh, opening cutscene, they're sitting under the tree and teacher just like kind of sneaky hugs. Uh, yeah, like the side hug, architect. right? Yeah. Yeah, and I noticed there was another one, uh, I think it was in the tutorial level when you uh, fold the uh, paper over, the architect sort of like backs up a little bit <laughs> because he sees this like gigantic paper folding in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you cannot fold over the character. That concept actually came um, pretty late. Yeah, um, we, we yeah. needed like a visual feedback for like, cause you couldn't fold over the player. We, we had locked that. So it was like, you fold up the player and it, it, the paper would just stop. And we're like, well, mm -hmm. we should make like some, some actual indication to the player that, that they can't fold over the character. And that's where the, the animations came out. It was really, it was really fun. Nice. So the other thing, like there's something I try to distinguish from like architect and teacher because their personality architect is more like um, more like teacher is more outgoing, architect is more like reserved. And so stuck in their own usually, head too. Sorry. sorry. So I was just going to say and the architect is stuck in their own head more too. Yeah, so you'll see like architect animation like feels slower than the teachers. Mm. Like teachers is more jumpy. Yeah. So many small decisions along the way, I'm sure, to make each character have uh, their own personality. Yes, and usually there's also like if you, usually like if they're interacting with each other, usually like um, usually I think teacher reacts first if there's something like, and then the architect follows. Usually I follow that. There's some exceptions, but yeah. And Steven, it looks like we have uh, some early storyboards too that you're popping up. Yeah, that's up for the opening cutscene right? actually, yeah, that one there. Oh, actually this background right here was some art that Stephanie did when, when she applied, so. Mm. You can see a lot of the ideas are already forming here. This is this is hidden, but uh, yeah. this was a really neat touch. This this rainbow bridge 
that the character is running across. It's hidden because she just uses a backdrop example, but it's it's actually yeah. like a ruler. So the rainbow is a ruler. It's, it's a ruler of time distance though. And how, oh, yeah. It had time on it, which is really cool too. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so Stephanie already I mean, had some ideas before even starting on this. Nice. Um, so we have Ryan on with us too. So Ryan, uh, tell us about your role on the game. How did you contribute and, and sort of, you know, what does it feel like to see the results now in, in people's hands? Oh, it's really exciting to release a game that I actually like. Um, <laughs> that's like a big thing. Cause like I, before I was working at Lightning Rod, I was just like freelancing a lot mm. on mobile stuff that I mostly didn't like. Like not good mobile stuff that you would have heard of. Um, gotcha. <laughs> like stuff that five people downloaded. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> yeah. So to come on to a fold apart was really exciting. Cause it's like, I'm making a core game that I actually wanted to make. Um, mm. I came on really late, so I was actually hired to make something else. Um, and then we just kind of needed another programmer on a fold apart, um, because like we ended up getting the Apple arcade stuff. So it was like, oh, we have to like port stuff and mm. we just need another person. So I actually moved from the project that I was on to a fold apart. Um, and that was very fun. It's, it was like really daunting at first. Because I'm coming into this big code base that Stephen had written. So like, okay, I don't know how any of this works and I don't want to touch it. But like my job is specifically like touch it, like make it work. Also like, fix the bugs in it. Fix the bugs yeah. that are in it. Like add new functionality. And I'm like, so like one of the first things that I did was I built the puzzle hint system. And like mm. I it took a few weeks yeah. to do it. And most of it came together in the last week that I was working on it. Like I probably worked on it for like three weeks to a month. And basically all of it came together in like the last month of that system or not last month, sorry, the last week of that system. Cause I finally got over my fear of touching Steven's code. And this was like, okay, I actually just have to change how things work. And yep. that was like really fast to get it done. It was like, oh, I should have done this three weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, because there's, um, there's that assumption that it's like, oh, things just need tweaking, and it's like, no, no, <laughs> doing. <laughs> oh no, I didn't even want to tweak. I was like, yeah. okay, how can I get around this without writing any lines of code in Stephen's classes? <laughs> like, the answer was, it's impossible. Yeah. Um, now I walk into things of like, uh, let's just delete like half of this. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, no fear I, anymore. <laughs> yeah, well. It's it's good to be not precious about the code base, and I think that helps everyone else too. Yeah, yeah but it took like a while to get get to that point. Um, yeah, I don't think he believed me at first. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. mentioned the the porting process too. So was the game originally what was the game originally uh, built for, and then what was that process like to uh, you know build out the porting for other platforms? PC console. Um, and then it's funny because I used to joke because the, the paper stuff looks really simple, but it requires like a lot of drawing and redrawing and like to get the, the effect to look right. And I used to joke, it's just like, oh yeah, this thing is definitely just a PC console game. And then people started talking more about mobile and then Apple obviously talking very seriously about mobile. And thankfully I'd done enough experimentation beforehand to know it's like, okay, yeah, this can probably work. Uh, <laughs> That's what as far as we got. It was before, like, yeah, it could probably work. <laughs> yeah, because we, we, we did a test for some, for some other people, I guess like a, a year or so, maybe a year and a half before that. And then I looked at him like, okay, in theory, this thing could work on mobile if we did X, Y, and Z. And almost by coincidence, we ended up having to do that anyway. That's true. Uh, because the workflow uh, for this game totally overwhelms Unity. Uh, mm. Because you see, there's, there's all kinds of environments in there. Like as you're walking through the paper, it's, each one's a different environment. Each one has their own lighting setup. And it even got to a point where it's just like the, the editor was just slowing to a crawl and we weren't able to work on the game properly. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I, I restructured the whole thing to break it down into all kinds of like little chunks. And then I made a bunch of tools 
for being able to um, dynamically like load and unload them, but just like in the editor um, so that right. the artists could do their work. Um, and then when you play the game, it would just load everything into memory. It's like, I'm going to go through this list of all my resources, pull this in, and then it's ready to go. Um, then when we were moving to mobile, I restructured that to be, well, let's handle this all dynamically. And uh, that's, that's sort of uh, the way it works. So we have like um, a back end in there where it, it knows where you're going. It knows what it needs to load ahead of time and what it needs to um, unload, um, which was actually a little bit tricky because we're using a 2018 version of Unity, which <laughs> does <Dell> not. <laughs> might be diving a little bit into the weeds, Stephen. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. But wait, wait. Isn't that what this this crowd oh, is? Know. This okay. is a this yeah. is a game making. Oh, okay. Crowd. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, um, we, have some, so, we have we have fans in there, but we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of developers and aspiring okay, developers too. Cool. They, they love doing really stuff like this. So, yeah. so one of the problems we ended up with, it's like, okay, we can load the stuff in smoothly, and we can hide that while the that you're playing. But the older version of Unity, it won't clear memory uh, regularly, so we just had to put in like sneaky spots in the levels <laughs> for the mobile version. You, you don't see this on the PC or consoles, but on the, on the mobile version, uh, there are spots where it's like, you're just walking along and you'll just see a hiccup for a frame. And mm. you're like, oh, it's, it's nothing. Games do that, frame skip, whatever. But it's actually us hitting the, the trigger to tell Unity to clear up the memory because we know by the time you've gotten to that spot in the level, this much memory has been filled up and wow. we, need to, <laughs> we need to hit that to make sure it doesn't like overflow and then crash out. I love and, the smoke and mirrors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of the game is. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's um, a lot of the ways we get like all the cool effects though with the perspectives and stuff too. That's, that's just us doing math. Like Steven did all the math. Well, I say us. Steven did the math on like <laughs> the camera positions inside the environments. So it simulates the same perspective. Mm. It's really cool. Gotcha. And I want to get to Kit too. We have, we have Kit Kwan on with us. Uh, and Kit, tell us about when you came onto the project and, and what you worked on for it. Uh, so I actually joined the team like pretty recently. So I've been helping out like with little tasks, like getting the game ready to launch because I came on at such a late stage that most of the game was already done. So right now for the most part, I've been working on, I guess, like secret stuff that we're not supposed to talk about today. <laughs> gotcha. So, <laughs> so I think what we can say is that there will be, you'll see more of this game coming. Yeah. I'm not talking about a sequel. I'm, no. I'm just saying the, there will there's be post-launch content. We can say that. There's, yeah. there's going to be post-launch content for the game. And uh, Kit, Kit pretty much single-handedly did all the design for, for the next one that's coming out. Yeah, that's really we're, cool. we're, we're pretty excited about it. Yeah. Is that on all platforms? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, well Kit, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and also, you know, I, I was really touched uh, by the soundtrack of the game. Um, who worked on the music? Where did you get it from? Um, tell us a little bit about the audio side. Oh, that's power up audio. And uh, We've got, I guess, a bit of a, a history with them. They did the soundtrack. Well, actually, they'd did worked with that? Mark. Yeah, yeah. They, they worked with Mark when uh, the founders of Power Up were working at a company called Somatone. In, mm. That's in Vancouver, right? Somatone? Yep, Somatone, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they'd worked with you. Was it? Actually, you tell that bit. Yeah, so I was working at a small studio uh, called the Yogo at the time. We were, we were doing uh, pitch concepts for, for a client. And we needed some sound, so we we hired Somatone to, to create the effects for it. And and Kevin and Jeff were both working there at the time. And then kind of coincidentally, like we we started our studio in 2013. I think they started right at the end of 2012. And so they were just looking for clients when we first started out. And um, we partnered with them on our, our first kind of ill-fated project that we worked on. Um, that was a, a free-to-play mobile game called Henchman. So it was a, mm. it was a multiplayer turn-based game where each 
each player was a, a super villain and you took turns kind of like putting traps down and having your putting out henchmen and and um and fighting each other that way and so they they came up with like the sound and and the music for that and it's just always been really good and then since then um we didn't really release anything until fold apart while they went on and just like won a bunch of awards for for game audio <laughs> so they, they did the audio <laughs> for like celeste and um and Crimson and Necrodancer, oh, which wow. they, won, they won game developer awards for on the other audio side of things. So, yeah, so we wow. were really excited to be able to work with them on on a fold apart, and uh, they introduced us to to Riley Koenig, um, who's the composer who did all the music for for a fold apart. Yep, gotcha. And the the soundtrack is available on Riley's Bandcamp. We're gonna have also, a link. Soundtrack we're gonna have a link to it. Uh, well, actually, sorry, yeah, soundtrack yeah, fold apart .com. We'll forward to it, so that's the easiest way cool. to get to it. Great. Um, now I know that you know a lot of folks on the team have worked on games before, released games before, but this is the first uh, game from Lightning Rod, right? Yes. Yep. Cool. So you know we have a lot of folks that are are watching that are not just uh, game developers but aspiring developers and looking to get into game development. What, what sort of advice would you give them about where to start right here and right now? Hmm. A big I mean, question. I, a lot of it is just <laughs> it's just practice and and just kind of iterating and doing stuff. So like this is our first launch game, but we, you know, as collectively as a studio, we've worked on a lot of projects and we do we've worked on even we're internally at Lightning Rod, we've worked on a lot of prototypes or things that we just didn't feel were were good enough to actually launch. Um, so a lot of it is just kind of iterating and and getting the practice and getting the reps with with making things and. And just kind of experimenting. One of the things I really, I, I really pushed really hard on, um, and I think it was one of the reasons why a fold apart kind of turned out the way it did, is I've always really enjoyed doing paper prototyping. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of the big things I did on Henchman when we were doing that game. It was a turn-based game, and so I made the game almost functionally as a board game um, that people could sit down and play. And I, honestly, it probably was better as a board game than it ended up being as a digital game, but. <laughs> um, it was it was helpful because it's a lot of it's a, a way that you can kind of do a lot of iteration as a designer, and you're not as dependent on um, like a, a programmer or or an artist to kind of see the things realized in front of you. And even on a fold apart, like I was able to do like every level, like I said, every level in the game has been done on, on graph paper to a degree. There's a lot of abstraction that goes with that, like envisioning where the characters will move and and how things will fall or interact within the level. But like we can draw it out ahead of time and, and just kind of play with the mechanics and. And, and see how things work. So I, I always really push like aspiring designers to, to play with that because it lets you do a lot of iteration really quickly in a way that is not dependent as much on, on other team members, which is really good. And like beyond that, you, you can make, um, you know, making, designing a card game, designing a, a board game is, is still game design, right? So you don't need to really make a video game to be a game designer. You can, you can really do a lot of stuff on your own that honestly you can do a lot quicker. And I think it, it, it's probably a better way in some ways to to get that practice, um, to kind of figure out what makes things fun and getting them in front of other players, getting getting stuff in front of players and getting feedback on it, so. Yeah. And also document it and document yeah. it in a way that makes it really, really easy uh, to put into like a portfolio because we read like for people that are looking for work, we read a lot of portfolios and resumes and the yeah if we're going to job job stuff so yeah. so Pres for game presentation design, is so important yeah 100 mm. percent. have a video for for whatever it is it's very unlikely people are going to download executables for for security reasons so having a video where either you're showing the gameplay as a trailer or like kind of stepping through it is is significantly easier to digest when you're looking at a portfolio and yeah. a lot safer so we're not downloading executables and running random executables that you're getting sent, so. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right, well, we're gonna go to some questions from the audience. Uh, let me grab one of these. All right. Let's start with a technical question from Dave. Uh, what were the best tools that you used to learn the ins and outs of Unity? Ah, uh, uh, trial and error. Um, <laughs> running, running into really weird edge cases and then trying to puzzle them out and then being forced through different areas of the documentation that might not have been exposed to before. Mm -hmm. um, that's a terrible answer. Um, 
I don't feel like it's wrong though. Like a lot yeah. of yeah. everything that I've learned about Unity is that I've been hitting my head against it since 2014, and every week I find something new. Um, I mean, <laughs> I found like against. three new things about <laughs> Unity that I thought were weird just this week. So it was like, yeah, yeah. Nice. What are the, the tools that we end up using? That do you mean like plugins or? Because like there's some well, plugins I, that I we it, really like. Oh, like the plugins that I like are um, Odin Inspector is probably the number one plugin yeah. that everyone needs working with Unity. Uh, that just makes uh, like our whole, tool design really fast. Yeah, all the design tools are made with that. It's really awesome. Yeah. And then how about the 3D models? Blender. We're, we're Blender. Uh, a Blender uh, house, I guess. And cool. uh, Stephanie used Photoshop, right? Nice. So all the uh, animator out there, that game animator, try Blender, especially <laughs> to Blender 2.8 and beyond. 2.79, which is what we're using for this game. <laughs> <laughs> Not very good, but <laughs> yeah, 2.8 is like, Oh my God, such an improvement. I would even say for like, for like simple, more simple stuff, it's way better than Maya. Um, I don't have that much experience with Max. I used it before. I mean, like, but not like in depth, but like personally, I, I, I would go like, like um, Max is even worse than Maya. <laughs> <laughs> personally yeah but yeah but blender has like 2.8 has stepped up a, uh, a lot great all right we have another question now i think mark you answered this early on but um, okay. for folks that might have missed it for joining us late uh liz b uh asked how long did it take you all to develop the game yeah it was a little over four and a half years so we started i think the idea kind of and we pitched the idea in early 2015 um and we started like full-time development in September, September, 2015. And then we've been working on it. Don, who then. was the, the first person came on in October. No, mid-September. Mid mid-September? Yep. Oh, October was when we went out to, and then we, so October we went out to uh, visit with our mentors at Execution Labs in Montreal. Mm. And so they helped us sort of refine like our, our production and, and pitch process. Um, and then in January, we brought on Karina, who was in marketing. And that was the team for almost Until the year. August. No, half yeah. six months. And then Robert came on, who was the, uh, the first animator. And Robert was uh, a, a new grad from Sheridan, and he, he was fun to work with. Um, <laughs> he did some really good stuff, but sadly, none, like none of it ended up in the game. All of his animation was with the old models, and so and so yeah. we weren't able to reuse really any of it. Oh uh, no! Yeah, yeah. Yep. I like his animation, so yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he did good, and then the and then there was some drama at the end of that year. Um, like not internally, like not, not internally, external, externally, external yeah. drama. Like so. Um, if we're talking about like games funding, uh, we were yeah. going through the Canada Media Fund, which is like, um, it's sort of like a, a investment program, I guess, but with like very generous terms if things go wrong. So um, what um, we ran into, we ran into like a funding hiccup where funding mm. disappeared for a few months. And then we had to, um, just like we're trying to it. <laughs> let it stretch it. Um, there was a long time where Mark and I didn't take a salary. Uh, and then we were also trying to figure out if we could do like outsource work for other people. <laughs> we were applying to like every competition we could with like a, a cash prize, I guess. I guess there was only <laughs> one real big one for that. Um, and then at the end of that year, there was... Uh, relief where we we got funding again it was the uh, day before christmas break that was what we found out it was like our christmas miracle we found out we got <laughs> more funding which was like enough to finish like uh, at least to get us like to the finish line for the most part yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then the next year is when uh, Stephanie and David came on. Mm-hmm. And that's when it actually feels like the game started. Yeah. It was like PAX, PAX East 2018. It was like, we took the demo, we took the demo to PAX East 2018. That was like when we really felt like, game felt really good we got in front of players with like our art style that we really wanted and like the, f- the whole first level was very similar to the one that we have now um i think we might have changed we, well we tweaked a lot of stuff as watching players play it and see where they were struggling um yeah. but that really I helped mean, we've, figuring that stuff out we've literally watched like easily over a thousand people play through that first a thousand level. A thousand per show <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's i i'm being i'm being really conservative in that estimate okay. but when you're like when you're when you're watching like a thousand playthroughs and you see where people are getting stuck like that that whole flow uh where people <laughs> people are just breezing through it now they're like oh this is so easy and we're like <laughs> well, well good, good good yeah <laughs> it should be it's the first level it's a tutorial so yeah. i want it to be yeah we we really smoothed out a lot of the rough edges on that um, yeah. but yeah, and then we, we got rolling on that. We worked for over a year. Um, Don departed the company. Uh, Stephanie became the art director. Uh, we brought on Adam as a 3d modeler and, uh, he, he filled out contractor. some of the last, yeah, contractor and, uh, he filled out some of the, the last assets. Um, and then a little while later, I guess the next year, uh, Ryan came on board for a different project. Um, we ended up getting the uh, the we becoming part of Apple Arcade, which had a really aggressive deadline. So Ryan got pulled off that project and put onto a fold mm-hmm. apart. Uh, we worked on that. Uh, we got to a point where we really, really needed another designer um, because there was just such a huge difference when Ryan came on board uh, because previously, um if i had to go do something like administrative then progress like stopped yeah it was it was literally the only designer and programmer were the two of us and so like if we went to like say like we just like we went to a show like when we were gone like no programming no design was getting done so oh right right yeah so and um and and you guys touched on uh like the the fund like the funding side of things we have a bunch of questions coming through on the business side. I think it's so okay. helpful for folks to hear how a game goes from like a dream to reality on mm-hmm. like the smaller studio level. So uh, one person asked, how did you fundraise for the game? It sounded like uh, the Canadian fund. Did you win yeah, so one of those prizes too? No, um, so, yeah, you go, actually Mark, you, you take you this. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so most of the funding for, for a fold apart, like the vast majority through production was, was through the Canada Media Fund. So there's a, a, it's a federal program in Canada um, where they fund up to 75% of your project and then take revenue share on the back end up to 50% um, until they make their money back and then, it, and then the rev share goes down. Um, we are also fortunate because we're based out of Ontario, which is one of the provinces in Canada. So there's a provincial program, which is a, a grant program. So we, we also got some funding through that, which is just just get money to help us develop the game. So I mean, the first, I would say, well, obviously the first three and a half years were basically that. Um, and that kind of basically got us all, I would say most of the way through the game um, complete. And then last year, um, a- Apple approached us about a uh, partnership with with Apple Arcade. And, and that was a really, was a really good opportunity for us. And we really wanted to kind of put the game on a mobile eventually. So it was a good incentive to kind of solve all those problems and and kind of continue to polish the game a little bit more probably than we would have been able to which i i think so all the all the platforms kind of benefit from from that partnership i think nice. yeah, i was actually really excited too about that because um that sometimes those are problems i i really like solving it's like oh how do we how do we how do we make this work um right yeah, I've been in similar spots in like a last job where I had a manager that just said yes to everything. And uh, <laughs> so he, he, he'd he say yes to like whatever and then come to me and be like, this is like possible, right? And I'm like, okay, yeah, we'll see what we can do. Um, <laughs> but those it's, those are kind of fun situations uh, to be in. Fun's, fun's not the right word. Sick maybe is the right word, but, <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting. Um, what was it like working with uh, Apple Arcade too? 
Oh, that's great. Uh, the partnership yeah. with Apple has been phenomenal. I, we really like working with them. They've been really supportive. They've been really excited about about the project from the start. So did they yep. reach out to you, or did you? They did. Like yeah, we we heard it. back. We heard. Um, I guess I don't know if they saw it at at PAX East last year or something. Um, mm. But but we got an email from them um, April last year about being yep. part of it. Yeah, one of the people from Apple gotcha. Canada had been familiar yeah. with the company and the project for a while. And so I think when this started, um, he, he just sort of like approached us because I, I think they were reaching out to all their networks and seeing what was available. And it, it, it turned out to be a, uh, a good fit. Gotcha. One thing um, that we do recommend, though, is <laughs> Mark and I are, are both enrolled in the project management classes now. <laughs> um, we we learned a lot of things the hard way. Yeah. Um, so if, if you're if you're talking about stuff like funding and grants, um, that's really, and tax, that's so that that's that's easier. But then <laughs> what happens later is that when your project gets to a certain size, you're also interested in things like tax rebates. Uh, oh yeah, right. Stephen cut it. Up, uh, Stephen. Yeah, froze yeah, for a bit. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, there's oh, there's oh. a bunch of other things like managing the managing the team um, becomes like a really big thing, especially as we start adding more people. Like we started as two or three people, and we've grown up to six now, right? So, um, right. kind of our workflow, and 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 one of the other things, I mean, you can see it too. We all work remotely, so this was this was the way that we. All right, okay. So it looked like we look mm -hmm. work remotely regardless, but we've actually been working remotely the entire time. So this is something that like through our entire uh, history as a studio, um, we've been trying to figure out how to um, kind of manage a team that's all distributed like this. And um, right. we learned a lot of lessons of that way. And I, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people out there now have kind of been thrown into it, have been trying to figure that out too. Um, right. It's not, it's not easy. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, challenges that you kind of go through when you're working apart. So. Yeah, uh, I have a question from Thomas. Uh, Thomas says, puzzle games are pretty hard to design for with many people having different levels of diff difficulty. Besides adding the hinting system, how did you decide how complicated the puzzles themselves will be, especially the final puzzles? That's a good question. And I'm like, we're even seeing it today when we read some of the reviews. It's like some people are like, oh, this is easy. I beat it in like two and a half hours. And some people are like, this is way too hard. It got too complicated. So I don't <laughs> think we even hit that even in the final game. Um, but uh, it, it's hard, especially when you're teaching like an entirely new mechanic. Um, a lot of it is just getting it in front of players. I, I would say overall, the, the puzzles that we end up using um, were were easier than some of the ones that were originally designed. Um, there were some puzzles that ha like they work. So there's also some puzzles that work better on paper when you are physically manipulating it. Like I feel like you get a better idea of how things connect sometimes when you're holding in your hand. Um, and it doesn't translate as well to digital. So we had to kind of scrap some of the, some of the more, more difficult puzzles. Um, but a lot of it's just like kind of putting it in front of players and just seeing which ones, like which mechanics were ultimately more difficult for players to kind of wrap their minds around or, or which ones. We also kind of wanted to, to layer the mechanics in a way that kind of conceptually made sense. So like we teach like just folding from the sides first, covering things up, folding from multiple directions. And then we like introduced folding from the top and like gravity. And then we do like corner folds. And then we do like later in the game, we do rotation. Um, so it was just kind of what felt, what, what required the earlier puzzle mechanics to kind of function in general. And then also like what felt more difficult. And it kind of also had a nice little knock on effect where a lot of the mechanics line up really well with um, kind of the emotions that the characters are feeling. And we, we lean into that a lot of the ways that we kind of, um, for the aesthetic of the mechanics when we end up putting them in the game. So like the idea of, of the, the uh, we call it the ops, like the roadblock in, in uh, chapter two, where it's like, it's representing, we, we skinned it. So it's like um, something from the city. So it's representing like the, the teacher's kind of anger with the, the city of like separating them mm -hmm. or um, in, we have the push block and like the architects feeling a little bit guilty that they left. So the block is like heavy and they're, they're like dragging it around and stuff like that. <laughs> so it, it kind of plays really nicely with like a little bit with the story as well. And that was kind of a more of a fortuitous circumstance that happened after we kind of laid out the, um, the order for the puzzles. But that was, that's really where most of that came from. So. Also falling. Gotcha. 
Yeah. And being turned upside down. Yeah. Introduced mm -hmm. at the same at the same point. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my com right, my computer didn't like me talking about taxes and I guess they have, yeah. forms and stuff like that. Yeah, we'll avoid just, questions like that from now on. It just blue screened and was just like frowny face. <laughs> <laughs> Documentation is boring. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions from Chris in our audience. Uh, okay. Chris says, "Hi everyone, congrats on the release. I've been really looking forward to it and tell everyone about it." I had the pleasure of playing at EGLX recently more than a few times and was wondering what, if anything, has changed since that playable demo. Uh, the first level is very, probably very similar. Um, uh, so that's what we bring to all the shows. So it gets, it, it's by far the most polished part in terms of, in terms of gameplay. Um, mm -hmm. There's always tweaks. I think we did, I'm, I'm almost certain we've tweaked things since October. Um, mm. So it's probably a little minor things. I wouldn't say there's anything major in that, in that demo. That's, that's still pretty much wholly what the first chapter is though yeah the, the um, first gotcha. the first chapter because i mean like it's a tutorial and so once yeah. you've found the way that your tutorial is effective which it, it wasn't at first <laughs> as, as soon as we got it where with where it's like a 99 percent success rate um then we were just like okay done yeah mm. on to other stuff so all right i actually do remember a part of the game that has changed but it's not in that first scene we yeah. changed how falling blocks work when they fall on you. Oh, That's that true. A, yep. Real <laughs> headache. Yeah, the blocks you should just sit on your head for a bit, and it felt really weird. So we have it like actually <laughs> reset the puzzle now if a block lands on you because we we don't there's no death in the game like you can't die so it felt weird for having a block and it's like it has weight but then it like lands on you and nothing happens so. Well, I feel like we also. That tried like several other things before oh yeah just, also like, it broke the game when it was sitting yeah, in your head so. we tried like <laughs> several other things before <laughs> just resetting the puzzle where it was like let's try to be smart and do physics and it was like no actually this is really hard yeah, <laughs> yeah that was that was one of the things ryan worked a, a lot on because like yeah the game worked but before he got onto that, it was just like if you played it properly. Yeah, that's, nobody, that's actually, nobody does. No, and that's the hard part about puzzles. puzzle games. And it's like, like we know what the answers are. So when we design it, and like when we're testing, it, it's really hard to test all of the. You basically need to test all of the wrong things to do in the in, right. a, in a puzzle, right? Because that's what people are when they're experimenting. They're just they're just trying to figure things out what the boundaries of the of the puzzle are. And um, that's where a lot of the edge cases get hit. And like, like we'll see. I think there's still, I think there are still some bugs in the game right now. Where um, you know, when people do things that we weren't really anticipating, um, it might it might not handle it well. For the most part, I think the game does a pretty good job of just either resetting the puzzle if it can, or we we really generous about our checkpointing system. So there's a checkpoint before every level. So if for whatever reason the game crashes to the main menu, um, you can kind of pick up from where you were. At least yeah. progress. All right, so we have time for one more question. So I'm going to pick one of Dave's question because Dave put through three, um, <laughs> and this one's on the narrative side. So uh, I'll read his his whole uh, his whole entry here. He says, "Hi there. I have already played and enjoyed a fold apart, and want to say congrats to everyone on some great work." Uh, the text messages sent between the couple were a main highlight for me, as they perfectly depict the importance of word selection while communicating across technology. I enjoyed the silly, silly banter back and forth, as well as the vague messages that le led to them being overanalyzed and driving the emotional mindset of the characters to frustration. Uh, how important was it for Mark and the team to fully capture the emotional toll that these text messages had on the character? Yeah, I mean, that's something that I definitely wanted to do, but as far as the actual writing of it, I think that's mostly Mark. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote most of it. Um, yeah. We did have a contract uh, a contract writer for a little mm. bit, but I would say pretty much everything from scene three on, or chapter three on was written by me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just I had a lot of fun writing it. Um, it was it was hard. Like you're kind of reliving some of the, the negative emotions uh, of being a part, um, but also from a spot where it's like you're looking back on it. So. It's a little, I guess it's a little bit different than, than being in it in real time, but there's a lot of stuff there where it's just like, I don't know, there's some jokes that I would have sent to, or, or we, like, like we would have sent back and forth or things I would say. Um, like the architects, especially, I feel like that's kind of how I type when I'm in text messages. And stuff too, so, um, 
yeah, it, it was it was fun. Like it was it was really important. I really wanted. I felt like that was like one of the core ways that we could do uh, storytelling. And when we realized that you know text messages would work really well as something a we don't have to voice act it, so it's a little bit cheaper. Um, <laughs> and also, it, it makes sense like for text. Like it is a it is a functional way of people, a, a functional form of communication that people use. And then the, the natural effect of that is, yeah, one of the things when you use purely text communication with each other is you inevitably have this miscommunication, right? So um, we really kind of it, it really things that just started tying together once we started exploring that space. Where we're like, oh yeah, and then the miscommunications lead to these emotional events and. And it was a good like way to tie in this idea of like why they're walking through texting in one area, and then it's like now they're solving these abstract folding puzzles. Like it, it yeah. was why how do we get from one to another, and and that was kind of the the end result of how we solved it. And, and the nice. difference between like how you feel and what you actually say to the yeah, person. Mm. It is, it's one of the things and it's 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 kind of subtle but like the architect will sometimes come to a conclusion at the end of their kind of emotional thought process and then just like not actually act on it so like they'll just <laughs> do something completely like they'll make a joke instead of actually um kind of even though they had this like emotional epiphany they, they don't actually they still don't have the emotional maturity sometimes to act on it they just kind of keep it internal so yeah and if they never like they're they're very much not perfect characters. Uh, they it, a lot of it is just gut. It feels like for them, because they they neither of them like they they think they know how they feel. But there's some moments where you like question that, and it's like, are they being honest with themselves about like what their motivations are? It, it's it just it feels very it feels very natural, and I, I think Mark did a really good job. Great. Well, unfortunately, we need to wrap up. Um, but thank you so much uh, to the entire team for uh, obviously being with us today, but even more importantly, making such a, a delightful, uh, important game, especially given uh, the timeliness of, of everything going on in the world. Um, so Mark, one more time, uh, where can folks go ahead and get the game for themselves? Sure. So A Fold Apart is available as of today on Apple Arcade, and it's also on Nintendo Switch and Steam. And then it'll also be coming out on PS4 and Xbox um, soon. <laughs> we don't have a date for it yet. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, and where can they follow along with uh, the studio and any upcoming projects too? Sure. Okay. So our Twitter handle is LRG for Lightning Rod Games. So LRG Thunder. And then uh, on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Lightning Rod Games. But I would say Twitter is our main. Twitter. We use Twitter more, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's our best. Great. I think technically we have an Instagram. <laughs> 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 and um, oh. folks that tuned in today too, we do have 10 copies, uh, they're Steam copies that we're giving away. So uh, we're not gonna do that live on the air, but we will uh, email folks that are randomly selected uh, using the email that you use to register for the Zoom itself. So uh, before we go, I wanted to propose a toast. So uh, team members, grab your glass of whatever. <laughs> and you have to hold it in front of your face, right? Because it'll disappear. Yeah, there you go. The invisible glass. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So a toast to uh, Lightning Rod Games, a fold apart, out now. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Go check out the game. Uh, and hopefully, we'll see you sometime soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Do we leave? Okay. I think we do. All right. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>